Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, ARIS pathways, which uh, Trinity kind of talked about a little bit yesterday, saying probably so far in, in terms of improvement of perioperative outcomes, it's been the uh, best thing that we've sort of done. Um, and yesterday I talked about some very sort of simple, uh, easy strategies of things we're looking at that might help improve outcomes. One of those was testosterone replacement. The other one was an immunonutrition drink. So I'm going to talk now about a lot of other concepts around things that we've done. I'll review what's out there already, kind of standard things to the AIRS pathway, and then I'll talk about some things that we've done. Uh, Dr. Schoenberg yesterday mentioned about prehab, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about prehab and some of the ideas around that. So uh, disclosures, um, how do you reduce complications with cystectomy? Well, I don't know. I have no idea how to do this. I haven't been successful in doing it. Uh, avoiding a urinary diversion uh, would be the ideal thing. Trinity talked about that yesterday, and as I mentioned, somebody smarter than me is going to have to figure that out, and I think Trinity is the one that's going to probably do that. Other than that, I don't have any other disclosures. I won't spend a lot of time talking about complications. We've talked about those. I'm not going to go over that anymore. Um, these are the most common complications. I do want to spend a minute here just talking about the quality of uh, adjusted life years as we age. And I think this is a really unique study that looked at this. Uh, it was published in PLOS One. And it showed that the benefit and the value that you get from a cystectomy in terms of quality of life definitely decreases as that patient gets older. I think we've known this. That's not anything unusual, but I do think, um, and, and there's going to be a really interesting talk at the SUO by uh, uh, Libby Wolf Birchfield, who's double boarded in both MedOnc and palliative care, and she's going to talk at the SUO about palliative care because we know it's underutilized in this patient population. Uh, as is radical cystectomy, we know radical cystectomy is underutilized in the older patient. Um, and you could say, well, is that a good thing or a bad thing? But this is old, old data from George Prow that suggested if you don't treat a muscle invasive bladder cancer that they do very poorly. The vast majority of people die within two years. Now this is old data. So I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe this isn't true anymore. Well, this is a recent study that confirms the same thing, that even in older patients, if you leave their bladder cancer untreated, they are likely to die of their bladder cancer. Now that's okay. It's okay to say hey, you're gonna die of this bladder cancer and put a palliative care plan in place. But I also think it also begs to say, if you're not following guidelines, if you're not treating them, you know, don't mislead them that they're gonna do fine and they'll, oh yeah, you'll probably live a long time. That is not what the data suggests. Um, and again, some other data just showing that even in elderly, cystectomy provides survival benefits. We talked a little bit about um, predicting morbidity uh, in the past. Uh, what, what are some risk factors? Well, frailty, as we've talked about in the numerous talks, is a risk factor. Loss of lean body mass, um, high Charleston score index. We've been developing a nomogram to predict complications based on a nu uh, numerous demographic factors, and uh, hopefully we'll be publishing that in the future. Um, these are just costs. I'll skip over that. So here are some of the ways that we have talked about possibly optimizing cystectomy. We've talked about immunonutrition. We've talked about sort of some other interventions. I'll talk a little bit about prehab. What is the data there? Talk about uh, early recovery pathways. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about uh, robotic or open approaches, but we'll talk about intraoperative management, postoperative support, and a little bit about frailty. So ARIS has become a really huge thing. Uh, just so everybody knows, it stands for Early Recovery After Surgery. These are our uh, clinical care pathways. Um, we had these at Vanderbilt even when I was a resident starting to sort of implement these. But now there's really a whole society and they hold meetings um, that are international meetings focusing on ARIS. And again, as I mentioned yesterday, we're, we're not the first to use ARIS. We are adapting this from other people. The colorectal people have really led the charge in this area. Here's some of the traditional ways we used to do cystectomy. You admitted them the night before, you did a bowel prep, you put in an NG tube or a gastrostomy tube and you didn't feed them for a week. Um, and we were trying to get away from that. And, and over here on the other side is just talking about some of the things that we're doing now, education, carb loading, no, uh, you know, trying to decrease narcotics with different types of blocks and other things like that, feeding them uh, immediately, no NG tubes, those are sort of the principles, uh, guiding principles around ARIS pathways. And if we look, there's not a ton of data, quite honestly, already out about ARIS pathways and the difference that they've made. But some of the early data, again, suggests that you can do these things, you can get patients out of the hospital quickly, and you can do it safely. Now, Todd Morgan from Michigan published a recent paper suggesting that 
There was a higher complication rate getting patients out of the hospital very quickly. I'm not sure that it matters whether there's seven days or four days. You might just catch that complication at seven days. I think the complications are probably the same. It's just whether they're in-house when they have that or not. Um, this is the only randomized trial so far published that looked at this and, again, um, showed improvement in a number of uh, issues, but uh, otherwise we don't have a lot of data in this area. Uh, the guidelines do support optimizing patients around cystectomy and that sort of supports using the ARIS. Okay, prehab. So prehab, what is prehab? Prehab means that I'm going to take a patient and I'm going to try to get them ready for surgery. And that may mean a variety of things to a variety of people. That can include smoking cessation, that can include optimizing nutrition, that can include uh, strength training, it can include a, a lot of different things. And I oftentimes make the analogy to patients, this is like training for a marathon. You've got to get yourself ready for that. The problem is we don't have very good data. And the, only, and, and the problem is that patient compliance is terrible. They really don't do these things. We talk to them about this, we talk to them about the importance, and they don't do it. And so if you look at the studies that have been published, um, very few people complete the prehab programs. And I think that's been really one of the challenges. Maybe that's because it's too difficult. Maybe it's because they don't understand. I certainly talked a little bit about medical literacy and about uh, how patients struggle to understand what they're going to go through and what we're going to do. And of course, you know, it's really difficult. You've got this patient, he's got this bad cancer, and then you start telling them, and by the way, you're going to do terribly. You're going to, I'm going to do surgery and you're going to do horribly and feel terribly for a long time. That's a hard conversation. So I think we tend to not really be able to tell patients how difficult it's going to be. Um, this is Jill Hamilton Reeves. I mentioned the uh, immune trial yesterday, so I won't go over this, but this is one option in terms of optimizing cystectomy. All right, what are some of the principles out there around ARIS? No bowel prep. So unless you're going to use colon, we should probably not be doing bowel preps. Now, there's a little bit of a swing back, and quite honestly, in the colorectal literature about this, um, but for the most part, there really aren't any good things associated with doing a bowel prep if you're using small bowel. Carb loading. Um, variety of different things. A lot of people are using Gatorade. Other people are using other uh, uh, carbs and you load those prior to surgery. Again, sort of uh, the, the theory being that you're giving energy for the patient to get through surgery. In the pre-op bay, uh, again, uh, scopolamine patch, Celebrex, gabapentin, uh, Enereg. We're going to talk about Enereg again in, in a minute. Um, we do TAPS blocks. A lot of people are doing these TAPS blocks. So they're sort of uh, peri-rectus blocks that are done. Whether you use Exparel, whether you use just a long-acting lidocaine, I think you could argue whether the data supports that. Active warming, and then uh, NICOM, which is a non-invasive monitoring uh, uh, device, although one of my friends who's an anesthesiologist calls it the random number generator. He just thinks it generates man random numbers and doesn't mean anything. Um, here's the data for albimopam. It does have level one evidence, and it is in the guidelines to use Enereg. This is a mu opioid receptor blocker, and it helps uh, for patients who have not been on chronic narcotics. It blocks those, res uh, those uh, receptors on the bowel, and it has been shown to increase return of uh, gut motility. And so uh, we do definitely recommend this. Again, this is given in the uh, preoperative bay and then continued on after surgery. Um, it is important to control intraoperative factors as best as we can. Temperature, I think everybody knows, now in the timeout, you're getting the upper and the lower bear hugger. That's part of our timeout. I'm assuming it's part of everybody's timeout. Glucose is interesting. We don't have a lot of data in glucose and how important monitoring normal glucose is. Um, we're actually doing a study right now where we're putting CGM monitors on patients and just seeing what, is, what does happen to their glucose continuously through surgery. So that's an idea is that maybe we're not actually doing uh, monitoring their glucose. I think probably low glucose is just as bad as high glucose and there's data in the cardiovascular literature that supports that's true. Uh, blood loss and fluid volume, and then, of course, decreasing operative time as much as possible. This is the NICOM device. It's a, it's a, they're a transdermal pads that are used, uh, sort of developed uh, to monitor cardiac output and sort of give you a way to monitor fluid status. Fluid status. Again, the idea that you want to use restrictive fluids, you don't want to give a lot of fluids to these people. Um, TIVA. TIVA is very interesting. I don't, how many, is anybody show of hands, their anesthesiologist promoting TIVA? total intravenous anesthesia. So it's interesting because what the, it, you're getting away from the inhalation agents and the idea is that those cause worse vasodilation and may lead to worse cancer outcomes. Interestingly, so far though, that's really just animal data. 
Um, there's really there's only been one study. It was a retrospective study done in breast cancer population that did not support that TIVA was useful. Uh, I've sort of gotten a little bit irritated because it seems like the patients are waking up with TIVA a lot more than they are with inhalation agents. And so that's been a little bit challenging for me. Um, and I'm not sure the data supports that at this time. Uh, fluid management. So I think Earth Studer has been one of the ones that's really championed this, and that is decreasing the amount of fluids that we give. So we're uh, really trying to not load these people up with as much fluid because what we know happens, and if you do a cystectomy, you'll see all that fluid go into the gut, and then that's leading to worse ileus. So trying to keep fluid status, trying not to load these people up, and I think one of the things that's really helped us is by not giving bowel prep, the anesthesiologists aren't like uh, pumping two or three liters of fluid into them right off the bat. Um, here's just some of the data that's presented, just showing that there's lower risk of ileus and other problems after surgery if you do these restrictive uh, fluid management strategies. Um, and then tra uh, uh, transfusions. And so I think everybody knows that if we can avoid transfusions, we should. There's definitely literature out there suggesting that if you get a transfusion, you have even worse cancer outcomes. So again, restrictive transfusion uh, strategies we tend to do that around seven. If it's less than seven, unless they're otherwise unstable, uh, we would not give them uh, blood. I will say uh, one of the challenges I found is that I have so many neoadjuvant chemotherapy patients coming in and they're starting at eight and a half. You don't have a lot of room. You don't have to lose much blood, get a little bit of fluid, and guess what? Their, uh, their hemoglobin is less than seven. But nothing irritates me more when they go in, their hemoglobin's you know, seven and a half, they get two units of blood and they come out 10 and they were higher than they even started. So again, that's a conversation you wanna make sure you're having with your anesthesiologist. So post-operatively, Lovenox, definitely, you wanna continue that up to 30 days post-operatively. Bowel regimen, early enteral intake, uh, avoiding narcotics, those are all sort of general principles of, um, of ARIS. Okay. I put this slide in here because one of the things that really irritates me is when we do things without any data and we do them just because that's what we've always been taught. So I'm sure, um, at least for me, I'm old enough. I was always taught you don't take it off an abdominal dressing for two days. Why is that? There is no data. And if you take those things off, they're soupy and they're nasty. And I was like, why are we doing that? I think that's one advantage of the robotic procedure. They just get der uh, Dermabond on there. They, they're, they usually don't even have a dressing on there. And we've gone away from doing dressings. So we're usually doing sub-Q closures and then we're uh, putting Dermabond, no dressing at all. Um, we also do that if they do have staples, we might leave a uh, dressing on overnight, but it comes off the next morning. Uh, don't lift anything over 25 pounds, no data. Did a litter search, there's nothing on that. Walking after surgery improves outcomes. I'm gonna show you data on that. And as I mentioned earlier, patients are invested in their outcomes and they want to participate. That is not what I have experienced. Patients want to, they want to lay around and have somebody wait on them. They do. And, and you know what, the best, here's, here's the trouble, right? So there are they're, they're significant others in the room and they're just kind of laying there and they're tired because they're not getting good sleep, they're getting woken up, but somebody else is waiting on them. And then you send them home and guess who has to wait on them? The significant other. So then as soon as they have a little bit of a problem, significant others on the phone call and saying, he's got to come back to the hospital. I can't care for him. I can't take care of this person anymore. So I think we need to be rethinking that a little bit and I have a lot of ideas sort of around that. So we ran a trial stands for LST, that was the company that we partnered with for our technology. And uh, these were sort of our, some of our things. We did publish this in the Journal of uh, Urology. Actually, Trinity's fellow, Meredith Metcalf here, um, is one of the people that uh, helped us champion this trial. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the things that we did. This is just a demographic, so I won't go through that too much. But basically what we did was we took iPads and we were able to buy iPads uh, for everybody through this pilot grant that we got through the Cancer Center and we loaded them with tutorials and we gave them to patients when they came in for their first visit and that was four weeks prior to surgery and we started trying to do education and we started trying to do a number of things to get patients ready for surgery. That included, we filmed the videos, we put them on there, we asked them to watch it. The devices were bi-directional so they could send us questions through that and we had a nurse practitioner that helped us with that to kind of answer a lot of these questions because it is a lot of information and it's a lot of time. Um, these are again the scripts that we use. We filmed uh, neobladders, we filmed conduits, uh, the care pathway, you talked about when they're going to go home, all those different things. Um, that started at again 21 days. One of the things that we've done that's been really, I think, probably valuable, although the data wasn't great on it, 
was what's called stoma boot camp. And we're still doing this now. We're using it as a billable uh, thing. But we send patients to learn about their stoma prior to surgery. They get marked. They meet with a patient who's undergone one. They talk to the stoma therapist. They get a tour of the floor. The only thing we've able to, been able to show is they didn't get discharged earlier. They didn't seem to have less complications. They did have a better uh, ostomy adjustment scale. You can give how well they adjusted the ostomy, and that was improved. Um, this was the boot camp. Uh, we do constipation screening. This is something that's really interesting. We have found a significant number of our patients come in prior to surgery constipated, and I don't have time to show the data, but they had worse return of bowel function. I don't know why you would expect if they're constipated before, you're gonna get their bowels going. So get your patients on bowel regimens prior to surgery, and then, uh, and then they have a better return of bowel function. Um, we did frailty screening. We uh, did this nutritional screening. I've talked a lot about that. Here was our data on the constipation screening, and again, it trended towards that. What about compliance? Uh, and we talked about prehab and education. We did have what happened with these patients was they started off, they got home, and they started viewing the videos, and then it dropped off as they got closer towards surgery. So again, it's, it's been a challenge for us for compliance with patients, and it goes back to whether they're invested in their care. Probably you don't know this, Garmin is located in Kansas City. Their headquarters are there, and we have a partnership with Garmin. And what we did was we got devices for all of our patients and we put them on and we said, okay, here are your goals. You need to walk 5,000 steps each day and I want you to increase that prior to surgery. So again, the concept of prehab, we're getting you ready. Then we're gonna give you goals each day in the hospital and when you go home and we're gonna see how that correlates to outcomes. Um, you can see here's how they sort of did in terms of their activity and recording that, that wasn't very good. Um, we tried to do that automatic, but. Uh, the device didn't have a sync for that, but we have uh, sort of figured that out now. Um, and this is our compliance. I won't go through this. Um, here's their steps. So you can see a lot, a lot of patients, again, try to do pretty good. And as soon as they go to inpatient, it really drops off and they really don't recover as well after surgery. Um, when we tried to correlate that with outcomes and, and uh, readmission rates, it, it didn't really correlate very well. However, those in the highest sort of quartile Again, they were healthier, they were uh, more motivated to begin with, they did seem to do better. Again, this is a small pilot trial, but um, you know, there's no data that says walking is better. We think it is, and we're trying to track that. Again, maybe there is, maybe there isn't, but again, um, it shows that it's a difficult uh, sort of thing to, to improve upon. Um, we were measuring vital signs when they went home. Again, the goal was that they could, we could identify people who might be getting sick give them antibiotics, try to give fluids, keep them out of the hospital when possible. Um, and, uh, and that was uh, met with some success, I would say. We were able to keep a couple people out of the hospital. For the most part, it didn't seem to really matter. Um, in terms of complications, again, we really didn't see any differences. And you know, I think what I would say is it's really hard to move the needle in these patients. Uh, and so the other things that we've talked about, hypogonadism, uh, constipation intervention, immune, those are all things, again, they're simple. I know there's nothing earth shattering about it, but again, anything that we can seem to do is what we're sort of trying to focus upon. Um, we're gonna be expanding our LST trial and trying to, again, continue to monitor and educate patients, um, help them uh, sort of take care, take, their, take control of their own care. One of my big things is, you know, if you take a patient from the, the recovery room in a bed and you put them in bed, that says you should stay in bed. We should not do that. We should put them in a wheelchair and we should take them and put them in a chair. And then you tell them get up and walk. What I would also like to do is I would like them to get their own medications. They shouldn't just ring the bell and they should get up and go to the nurse's desk and ask for their own medications or their meals. Um, the hospital has not liked that idea very much. Um, the nurses love it. The nurses are like, we love you, we want that. But uh, the hospital hasn't liked that idea. And there are some safety issues around that, I understand. So. Conclusion, uh, cystectomy remains a morbid procedure. You know, we're doing a lot of things, but it's really hard to move the needle. I do think errors pathways are critical, and I think we can continue to refine these. I do think patient education, obviously I'm a huge proponent of education, but you know, I don't, they don't oftentimes participate, and it's hard, to, it's hard to get patients invested in their care. But I do think we need to continue to leverage technology. Uh, the Garmin uh, device is just one of many. Apple obviously is working on a lot of things. Um, but I think hopefully in the future we'll be able to do a lot of things with these devices, particularly remotely. 
Uh, here were some of our funding. Uh, this is a picture of Union Station. This is where the parade ended yesterday and all the debauchery happened in Kansas City. Um, and these are some of the people, I'm sure you recognize some of these people up here, Dr. Thrasher, uh, who's been involved in this project and was uh, helpful in supporting this as well. So thank you very much.